man, I'm, I'm excited for that moment. In fact, if God decided to rapture us, uh, us right now, I wouldn't mind so much. Uh, <clears throat> but if you turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter number 2, Galatians chapter number 2, we're going to look uh, in verse 20. Uh, and I'm going to be jumping around the Bible a little bit tonight. Uh, and feel free to, you can try to keep up with me or you can look up the verses later, whatever you'd like to do. But we're going to start in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So tonight we're going to be talking about a funeral. Now as Christians, funerals are um, a little bit of a different thing because they're painful. We're going to miss the people that, that, were gone before, uh, that have gone before us. Um, and, and they do hurt. But at the same time, we know that because this life on earth has ended for them, a new life has begun. And that they're in a better place. And, and tonight, we're not talking about funeral for a loved one, but the question is, have you ever been to your own funeral? And today, we're going to be talking about a special kind of funeral that needs to take place in each and every one of our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity um, to stand in this pulpit, Lord, to, um, to preach your word. I pray that you would help me to have the words to say, Lord. Help me to rely upon your wisdom, Lord, and that you would lead me. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to learn something out of, uh, from this message tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing we're going to look about, uh, at about this funeral is that it's a personal funeral. I'm not talking about a funeral that's taking place for the person sitting next to you, not a funeral for your spouse, not a funeral for your sibling. This is for you. It's a funeral that God wants to take place in your life. The Bible says, I am crucified. The Bible talks about how each of us need to be willing to die to ourselves. Each of us need to be willing to give up our own lives for Christ so that we can live for him. It's personal. I am crucified. You know, you're, we, we understand the fact that Christ's death on the cross is what provided a way for our salvation. We understand the fact that there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to get, our, get ourselves to heaven. The only way that we can get to heaven is by putting our faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we all understand that fact. And yet when it comes to living the Christian life, it seems like we try to do it in our own power and in our own strength. And yet just as much as you cannot get yourself to heaven, just as much as you have no ability in and of yourself to get there, to wash your own sins away, you cannot be sanctified in your own power. The only way you'll be sanctified is by dying to self. We are sanctified through identifying with the death that Christ had on the cross for us. And it's just as much his power as salvation is his power. Galatians 3 verse 3 says, Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by flesh? He says, are you, are you, are you stupid? He says, are you, are you so foolish? What, what, what is going on in your mind that you think you had to, by the Spirit, begin this? That the only way you could be saved was by the Spirit of God, was by the grace of God, was by grace through faith. And yet now you're trying to live as a Christian in your own flesh? He says, are you foolish? That's, that's not how God set it up. It must be accomplished through the strength of God. Sanctification is just as much by grace as salvation is. And today we're looking at that personal funeral, a funeral that needs to happen in your life, a death that needs to happen in your life. No, not a physical death. You, you, I'm, not, I'm not saying we all need to die here in this church building tonight, physically, but that each of us need to die to ourselves. Well, what does that mean? We're going we're gonna to look at that tonight. What does it mean? I understand, Pastor, it's for me, but what does that mean? Well, first we can see it's a practical funeral. It's practical. There's things that, that God expects that you can see in our life to have this funeral. First, you have to die to your old sin. Romans 6, 11 says, Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through, Christ, uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The things, you know the song, the things I used to do, 
I don't do them anymore. And yeah, it's a kid's song. We have fun. We sing it at camp almost every time we go. And uh, it's fun. We normally put in funny, random things in there. I'll point at a kid at camp and they'll say the, the books I used to read, the, you know, the, the things I used to eat, the things I used to smoke. I don't smoke them. And they you know, go through. And we can have fun with it. We say a lot of different fun things. But at the end of the day, this should be true. That we should have died in our lives to the sin of the past, to the sin of the old man. We are, there should be a change in our lives. You should say, no, I don't serve sin anymore. I serve God instead. Uh, in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. The Bible says we should be dead to sin and instead live to something new. We should live to righteousness. We should, we should live in Christ. And uh, it's not good enough just to die to the old sin and not put anything new on. The Bible talks about putting on the new man. And a way that you might be able to understand this, I'm on a diet right now. Okay? And if I decided for my diet, say, okay, well, I'm going to stop eating all the old bad things I used to eat. I'm going to stop eating, you know, McDonald's, not having McDonald's anymore. I'm going to stop drinking drinks that, you know, the coffee with all that sugar and stuff in it. I'm done with that. I'm going to stop eating bread. Right now, I'm not eating bread. I'm not eating any carbs or anything like that. I'm going to stop eating all that, but then I don't replace it with anything. So now I'm just not eating anything. Okay, that's not going to end well for me. I have to replace it with something good. So I'm not going to eat that bread anymore, but I, maybe I'll have some cauliflower instead. I'm not going to go to McDonald's anymore, so I guess I'll go to Subway and get a salad and do the best I can there. And um, you got to replace it with something new. But also, if I said, you know what, I want to be healthy, so I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat salads and I'm going to eat cauliflower and I'm going to eat all these healthy things, but I'm still going to go to McDonald's every day and get a cheeseburger. And I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna drink that coffee with all the sweetener in it. And I'm still gonna eat all these bad things, but I'm gonna add to it these good things that I need to eat. Well, that's not gonna work either, is it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up, if anything, gaining weight because now I'm eating even more food than I used to. Okay. And in the Christian life, though, sometimes one of those mentalities is what we have. We think, well, if I just get rid of all my sin, and you're focused on getting rid of the sin, being dead to sin, but you gotta replace it with something. I gotta say, it, it, dying to sin is more than just dying to sin. It's putting on something new. It's living in righteousness. Saying, well, I'm not going to go to those places I used to go. Well, I'm going to go to church instead. Friday nights, those parties I used to go to on Friday nights, I'm not going to go there, so I'm going to go to RU instead. You know, in the, in the evenings when I used to watch those shows that I really shouldn't be watching, I'm going to read my Bible instead. And replacing those things that are wicked with something new and something righteous, and something good. And if you don't, it's not going to work. If I went on a diet and decided I was going to get rid of all those bad things and didn't replace them, I'm telling you right now, that would not last, but it would last probably less than 24 hours. And I would be, I'd be right back at McDonald's getting something to eat because I need to fill myself with something. And if you try to just get rid of all your sin, all that old stuff in the past, and you don't refill yourself with something good, with that the, the living water that we were singing about tonight, then you're just going to end up going right back to it. you got to replace it with something good. But also, you can't just add on the good things. You can't say, well, you know, I'm going to keep going to those parties I used to go to, but I'm also going to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to watch that TV show that I know I shouldn't be watching, and then right afterwards, then I'll read my Bible. And you know, if you're just adding these good things into your life, that's not dying to sin either. And neither one of those things are going to work. So we have to be willing to die to our old sin, to the things in our, to the habits that we have that we know doesn't ple don't please God, to the actions that we take that we know God isn't happy with, to the people that we may spend time with that we know God doesn't want spending time with them, to the places we go we know God doesn't want us to go. We need to die to those things and instead live unto righteousness. So we need to die to our old sin. We also need to die to our old lust. The Bible tells us to flee also youthful lust, our, our sinful desires, the things that we want. We need to get rid of those things and again, replace them with the right desires. Our inward sin that causes us to drift away from God, 
The things that we think, you know what, it's not a big deal. It's not affecting anybody else. It's just going on right in here. And nobody else even knows about it. And it's not going to hurt anybody. Just let me, let me have this attitude that I have. And you know what, I'll get it right later. Let me hold this bitterness in my heart and I'll take care of it later. Let me hold on to these desires that I have for my life. But I'll still serve God. We got to get right, not just what we're doing on the outside, not just, as the song says, the things I used to do and the places I used to go, but also the things I think about and the things that are going on in here, the desires that we have need to change. And the only way that's going to happen is if we, if we fill ourselves with the right desires. Colossians uh, chapter 3 says, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. The Bible says you are dead, and because of that, set your affection on things above. You're dead to the old ways of life. You're, the old things that you used to want, the desires that you used to have for your life, the, the, the passions, that you, the things you thought you were going to do with your life, the Bible says die to those things and instead set your affection on things above. Instead of having a desire for more riches, we should have a desire to, to give to God and to see God use what our, our life for him. Instead of a desire for people to know our name, we need to have a desire for people to know the name of Jesus. Instead of having a desire to, to for, our, for people to, um, to look up to us, we need to have a desire for people to look up to God. And instead of our own desires, instead of our own aspirations, we need to fill our heart with the desires that God wants us to have. And um, I don't, I don't know about many of you, but I, I am the type of guy, I am not a huge fan of shopping. I really, I'm not, I, I do really enjoy shopping for about four and a half minutes. That's about it, you know, and, and I will get like, if I'm in a store for an hour, every once in a while, I'll find something that I like to look at for like 30 seconds, and then I am back to, you know, not really enjoying it as much. But, uh, so this Christmas, at Christmas time, we went, I went shopping with my wife and my sister and Austin, and we had a great time. But there's just some stores that I am not a huge fan of going into. Stores like, like Gordman's, okay? I don't know if any of you have been in Gordman's, but it's not really one of my favorite stores. Oh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Turnbull back there said he's been in Gordman's. It's his favorite store, right? No, no, not, not, oh, it's her favorite store, yeah. So stores like that and not that I won't ever once I get in there I normally find something that I might be interested in but I'm normally not that excited about going into it and my desires my heart is not to go into those stores I'd rather just sit in the car and wait and sometimes when you go grocery shopping that's what I do my wife goes in to get the groceries and I'll sit in the car and wait because honestly that's where I'd rather be but at this time I I think it might have even been my idea to go shopping and go to Gordman's and go to these stores because I wanted to, my wife to be happy, and I wanted to have fun with my sister, and Austin probably hated me for it, I don't know. But I, want, I wanted to do it not because it's what I wanted, but because I had changed what I wanted and tried to do what my wife wanted to do. And in the same way, in our life, if we get too focused on what we want, we're not going to be able to please God. Instead, we need to say, you know what? What I want most in my life is to please God. And there are things in my life that if it were up to me, would be different. There are things in my life that if it were up to me, I would have. There's things in my life, if, if it were up to me, what I would use this money for might be different than what I'm going to, but what I want more than anything else is to please God. A mentality of seeking first the kingdom of God, of wanting what God wants above anything else. Why? Because we love him. Because he's done so much for us. We, if we gave him the rest of our lives, every second of every day, every penny that you ever earn, if you give it all to God, you still won't even have hit the tip of the iceberg of how much you owe him. Amen. And that's why we do it. That's why we need to change our desires. Um, so we need to die to our old sin, to the actions, the, the things that we do. We need to die to our old, our old desires, our old lust. But we also need to die to our old logic. To our old way of thinking. If we want to live in Christ, we need to have a funeral for our own thought processes. Because many of us, in our own minds, we have our logic and it makes sense to us and this is what we think is best, but we need to give up that logic and trust that what God wants 
is what's best. It's not just about your desires. It's about that way of thinking. God's commands don't always make sense to us. What God wants us to do isn't always going to add up in your budget book. What God wants us to do isn't always going to make sense on paper if you try to figure it out. But we must put our own logic and our own thinking aside and trust God. We need to walk in the Spirit so that we're not fulfilling those lusts of the flesh, the things that we want. We need to walk and trust that what God wants is what's most important. Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God says, my thoughts are so much higher than yours. And you, with your, with your small, tiny little brain, you think you got it all figured out. And I do many times. I think I, I know exactly how things should work, and I know how it should happen. And God says, no, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And what God says in this book and what God uses his Holy Spirit to convict you about, it doesn't matter if it makes sense to you or not. That's what you need to do. We need to die to our own logic, die to what we want, and instead live our lives trusting God and living the way that he wants. So if we do this, if we die to ourselves, if we're willing to die to our old sin, if we're willing to die to our own desires and get rid of those own desires and desire what God wants instead, if we're willing to die to our old logic and our own way of thinking and trust that God's way of thinking is the best way of thinking, thirdly, it's going to be painful sometimes. It's a painful funeral. As I said earlier, you know, as Christians, we know that our family, when they pass away, they're going to go to a better place. We know that this death means a better life for them. But that doesn't take away from the fact that it's still painful. And dying to self is painful sometimes. Getting rid of those sins in your life that God doesn't want to be there can hurt. Trying to give up your own desires and replace them with the desires that God has, sometimes it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like what we want. And it can hurt us. Trying to put away our own logic and trust that God knows best, it can be stressful and it can be painful to us sometimes. It, it, it can. And as much as we know, me, if I give this up, God's got a better plan. And, and you can know that, but it's still going to hurt sometimes. As much as you can know, you know what? God knows best, and if he doesn't want me to have this, then he's going to take care of me some other way. As much as we know that, it still hurts sometimes. As much as we know that, you know what, these may not be the people God wants me to hang around, and I need to find myself new friends, as much as we know that God is going to give us a better one, it still hurts. And it will be a painful funeral. The Bible says in Romans 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So it talks about what, what's happening to our flesh. We're crucifying it. We're destroying it. That doesn't sound like a pleasant experience. No, it, it sounds like it's, it's going to be painful. And yes, at times, it will be. Because we're identifying with the pain and suffering that Jesus went through when he died on the cross. And he had nails pounded through his hands and nails pounded through his feet. And he had a, thr uh, a crown of thorns on his head. And he was whipped beyond recognition. He went through that pain, and we are identifying ourselves with that pain. Surrendering fleshly desires, our own tendencies, our own nature, old habits, it's going to be painful. Romans 7, even Paul admits, and Paul, you know, you look at Paul. Paul's what, I, I like reading about Peter, because Peter is at least a little bit relatable. I, can, I feel like, man, like maybe I can be like that one day. But when I read about Paul, it's like, wow, like he is... He is so much more than I could, I could ever be. And yet, even Paul, he admits that he had a struggle with fighting with his own flesh. He says, you know what? The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I wish I'd do, I, I, man, and, and he, he struggled with his own flesh. Even Paul did. So it's not going to be like, well, just let me go ahead and say a quick prayer and I'm going to walk out of this room dead to the flesh and everything's just going to be easy peasy. No, even Paul who walked with God, who, who, who talked with God, and who was, who was one of the, 
one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest leaders of, of the church age, and he, he was an apostle. He even struggled with it. And we are going to struggle. There's going to be days where it's harder than other days. And next we, we see that it's not just painful. It's permanent. It's a permanent funeral. And you know, the fact is, every single one of us, if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, our flesh is already dead. It's already dead. It's, it's, it has been destroyed. The Bible told us that. It has been crucified with Christ. The Bible says in Romans 6, 7, um, sorry, in 1 Peter 2, 24, who, is his own, who his own self bear our sins in his own body. It's talking about Jesus on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. The Bible says we are dead to sins. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your sins were, were taken care of there on that cross that day. And your flesh has been destroyed. So why do we keep going back to our flesh? Why do we keep going back to our same fleshly desires? Why do we keep living our life in slavery to sin? Our, our flesh has no power over us. You have no reason to have to be living in that sin anymore. You have no reason that, that you shouldn't be trusting God and his plan over your own. There's no reason you should, be, you should be having the same worldly desires that you used to have. And yet, we go back to that dead flesh and we pick it up and we carry it with us. We say, well, I know you, I know God, I know you got rid of it, I know you killed it, but I really like holding on to it. I want to hold on to it. I want it to come with me. I want it to be with me. And we choose to live our lives in subjection to sin when we don't have to. You know, it's, it's easy to talk about all the problems that are going on in the world. It's easy to talk about how messed up some people are in their thinking. How, how you know what, the, the politics in our country are just going awry and things are a mess and the, the liberals are this. And it's easy to talk about those things. It's easy to talk about how messed up everybody else is. But the fact is, the Bible talks about those unsaved people as sheep that don't have a shepherd. They're still living in slavery to their sin. They don't know any better. You can't expect unsaved people to act like they're saved. You can't expect people who are still in bondage to sin to somehow be walking around in freedom from it. And yet it's easy to talk about how they're messed up and us who our flesh has already been destroyed. We've already been given the victory. Our chains have already been broken. And yet we walk around carrying that same old sin on our back. God's already won the victory for you. And I, I remember, uh, for me, it, there was one day where that really clicked. And it was when I was in training for neighborhood Bible time. It was, uh, I basically did vacation Bible schools in America. And they have like a really intense training a couple weeks. And during that training, there was a preacher that came in. And he preached for like five hours straight. And he was talking about this. Talking about the fact that God's already won the victory. And he was talking about the fact how a lot of us were trying so hard to win a battle that's already been won for us. And he talked about how all we have to do is claim the victory that Jesus has already had for us. All we have to do is let go of that sin. All we have to do is set it down. As I said, die to self and live for Jesus Christ. And it sounds like, you're like, that sounds so easy, but I've tried it. It's just so hard. That's because you're trying to do it in your own strength. God's already done it. And as he was talking about it that day, man, it just, it clicked in my mind. And after he was done preaching, they gave us some time to pray. And I prayed and I got some things right with God that I had never thought I, I was going to be able to. There were things in my thinking and, and things that, that I had in my own heart that I had been battling with. And because of that, because of that, that, that moment that it just clicked there and God helped me to understand, hey, Ryan, I've already won that for you. You're trying so hard in your own flesh to defeat the flesh when the Spirit's already killed the flesh for you. And it, it really, it changed a lot of things in my life that day. Um, so we have to realize it's already been won. It's permanent. We have been given victory, and yet we want to go back to our old sin. We're afraid of what we might be missing out on, what, what other people are, are doing. You've already won just Leave it, leave it alone. Leave it sitting there where it belongs. So we know that it's, it's, it's painful. We know that it's permanent. 
But you know, if you are willing to die to self, finally, it is a powerful funeral. It can be powerful in your life. The fact is, you are free. Romans 6, verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. You are free from sin. Sin has no bondage over you anymore. And the moment you realize that, it can be a powerful day in your life. The moment that you say, you know what, I'm going to have a funeral for myself. I'm going to get rid of my flesh. I'm going to lay down this old dead flesh that I've been holding on to for so long. And you have that funeral, it's going to be a powerful day in your life. You're going to experience freedom like you've never experienced before. Because you are free from sin. And you are alive. Romans 6, 11 says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead and did unto, uh, dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, the, the day that you die is going to be the day that you live. That's what the Bible says. The day that you die to self is going to be the day that you really wake up and start living your life the way that God means for it to be lived. And God, the Bible, it's powerful. You're going to be free. You're going to be alive. And yes, you know what? There's some days it's going to be painful. But that pain in the end is so worth it for the freedom that it gives. That pain, that little bit of pain that you might go through in giving up your own desires and your own logic is so worth it when you start living, truly living the way that God wants us to live. You know, and so many of us were walking around like, like zombies, like, you know, like, like the living dead. Like we are, we're just walking around living our lives, walking through these motions, and we truly haven't found victory. We truly aren't alive in Christ. And God says, give it all up. Lay down that flesh. Lay down the sin that I've already given you victory over. And you know, for some of us in here, that means coming to Jesus Christ for the first time and accepting him as your savior. For some of you, you say, I've never experienced that victory because I've never experienced salvation. I don't know what it's like to be free from sin because I've never asked God to free me for that first time. I've never come to him and asked him to wash my sins away. And for some of us in here, you're in bondage to sin still because you've never been saved. And for others, you may have been saved a few months or maybe you've been saved for years and years. And yet you still live in bondage to your sin. You still live in bondage to your own way of thinking and your own logic. You still live in bondage to your own sinful desires. And many times we get to that place as a Christian and we need to come and have a funeral for ourselves. Give up what we want. Give up the way we think. Give up our sin. Say, God, I want to live. God, I want to be free. And you've already given me that freedom You've already defeated sin. You already have a path that I can live and I can walk in. Help me to realize that victory in my life and to live the way you want me to live. Lord, I thank you so much for giving us the victory, Lord. That, Lord, it's already been won. I pray that you would help each and every one of us to have a funeral for ourselves, Lord. If there's something in our life that we've held back from you, Lord, if there's an area of our life that we're still living in our sin, Lord, I pray that you would help me, help each of us to see what that is, Lord, and have a funeral to it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If there's anyone in here that says, you know what, Pastor Ryan, I've never experienced that victory because I have never asked Jesus to be my Savior. I don't know for sure that I'd go to heaven when I die. If that's you, you say, I, if I die today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. I don't have that victory because I've never accepted it. Would you raise your hand? You say, I am not saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I want to be sure. I would love it if someone could talk to me about how I can know I'm going to heaven. Is there anybody in here like that? Amen. And the second question is, is there anybody in here who says, Tonight, there's areas in my life that I'm still living in my sin. I'm not dead. Maybe it's the way that I think, my logic, the way I make my decisions. Maybe tonight it's, it's your desires, some things that nobody else knows about, just the desires that you have in your heart that you're still holding on to. Or maybe there's sin in your life 
that you need to have a funeral for. If there's anybody here tonight that says, Pastor Ryan, there's something in my life that I need to have a funeral for. Would you raise your hand? Anybody here that says, there's something in my life that I need to die to. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hands all over the room. You can just put your hands down. As the piano starts to play, if God has spoken to your heart, don't hesitate.